All right, DM James back again. Welcome to Roleplay the Right Way with your bro, DM James. GM James, Game Master James, Jamesy Jamie James. Ladies love cool games. Uh, and this is part two of the Adventure Con for King class book. Now, I'm going to be a little bit quicker here because the last book had, I believe, eight or ten classes in it. This one's got like a ton more, so we're going to have to speed through here a little bit. But let's talk about classes because, once again, classes make a game. And uh, especially a class-based game, I should say. Yeah, I wouldn't say that for Traveler, right? But, yeah, the classes you can play, they really make a game. And games like D&D, I think, are best served by very iconic classes because people play elf games, I think, in my experience, because they want to fill these iconic, heroic roles, and it just makes them more comfortable. Uh, probably one of the reasons I have such a hard time convincing my play group to play games like Coriolis or Traveler or even Stars Without Number, you know. Uh, most of my, my players, they just really love the whole iconic, good versus evil uh, elf game kind of we're the good guys the orcs are the bad guys we don't have to worry about some stuff you know let's loot dungeon stack gold pieces to the moon that whole sort of thing that's how my group is but let's get into it there are some really cool classes in this book after you have purchased the core book you really owe it to yourself to pick this one up too uh do you need it no but i think yes so if you want to play the really awesome game I, I i think yes uh i'll go ahead and list the 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 classes and then we'll go into a little bit of detail about them individually uh, as always if you want more detail one i think these books again are on sale on drive through rpg the pdf i think is like six or seven bucks right now uh and two I, i'll answer any questions you have you can hit me up on the various discords i'm on or you can just Put it in the comments below, right? So this book has 18 new classes. The Anti-Paladin, the Barbarian, the Dwarven Fury, the Dwarven Machinist, the Dwarven Delver, one of my favorites. The Elven Courtier, the Elven Enchanter, the Elven Ranger also turns out to be really good. Gnomish Trickster, Mystic, Noberon Wonderworker, Paladin, Shaman, Thracian Gladiator, a lot of times I say Thraxian, but it turns out I'm totally wrong. It's Thracian. And while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to have a drink of... If you guys are wondering what this weird-looking thing is, this is simple red, the powder, that's supposed to give you all of your nutrients and vitamins and all that great stuff. That's what I'm drinking. Been a stressful couple of weeks. I need my vitamins and nutrients. All right. So Thrassian Gladiator, the Venturer, the Warlock, the Witch, and the Zaharan Rune Guard. Ruin, not Rune, Ruin Guard. Right. So jumping right into it, a lot of these characters, you know, their their takes on uh, archetypes that you're familiar with, but they do it a little bit different, and I think you might like them. So the anti powder. Every bit as vile as paladins are heroic, the anti-paladin is the dark twin of those champions of light. Fanatical followers of the Chthonic gods, anti-paladins are capable of any atrocity, any villainy, in service of their divine patron, furthering the spread of chaos, evil, and corruption. Anti-paladins are unconstrained by codes of conduct, their only true inviolate tenet being unwavering faith in their unholy patron and the drive to spread that patron's particular brand of evil by whatever means necessary. Cunning, treachery, and deception are all considered worthy tools in the anti-paladin's arsenal. Weapons every bit as valuable as the most savage of blade. All right, first off, paladins and anti-paladins in this game are a dice six class. Only fighters and dwarf... Uh, a couple of dwarf classes are die eight. Everything else, for the most part, is die six. And then, of course, thieves, mages, that type are die fours, right? 
So your paladin, he's going to get a damage bonus like a fighter. He gets a very good um, attack bonus. Um, he also, like the paladin, gets a detect good ability, the reverse of detect evil. Uh, this is an ability I generally don't like detect alignment abilities in my games. It hasn't come up yet, so I haven't made my mind up on that. But typically, I just don't like it. I, I, I think it's... Hmm. Uh, however, they are washing the powers of unlife, right? They can command... Uh, should they become intelligent undead, whether as a reward from their chthonic patron or through efforts of their own, they continue to advance as an anti-paladin. And what that means is exactly what you're thinking. If a paladin gets uh, level drained, or an anti-paladin gets level drained by a white or some other thing that creates another intelligent version of itself, right? Well, they come back with their levels of anti-paladin and continue to level. Yeah. Yeah. Can you imagine running up against the... Uh, you know, the white that's also a level six anti paladin. That is a rough guy right there. So, anyway, um, this is an ability called After the Flesh. A lot of your anti paladins, your chthonic worshippers in the, the, the default setting, their goal is to become undead. So, there you go. They also have the option of lay on hands. They get a plus one bonus to their morale. The morale their hireling to a plus one bonus to morale score whenever he's present because of fanaticism. They can start their own uh, kingdoms and the, the whole nine yards. So, yeah. The Barbarian. Not like you think. The Barbarian is a strength con prime requisite. No requirements. Die, hit, die. They do not... Oh, no, they do get the damage bonus of fighters. Uh, what separates them from fighters, and also bear in mind, every class in this game has a different required XP level or uh, amount to reach different levels. So uh, they do level differently. Thieves level incredibly fast. Uh, mages level slower. Right. So barbarians are tough, hardy warriors from cultures outside the civilized world. Some barbarians live on the edge of true savagery, while others hail from rich cultures with epic poetry and weapons of steel. But all share an outlander's mix of contempt and awe for the grand tapestry of civilization. In the Iron Empire, barbarians might be reavers from the bleak wastes of northern Jutland, fierce horse archers from Skysostan, or tribesmen from the Ivory Kingdoms, or the Ivory Kingdom jungles of Kieta, Monde, and Kashtu. Whatever the background, they are fierce and deadly combatants. So, yes. Uh, they get the same attack uh, bonuses as fighters. They get the same damage as fighters. Uh, they can only wear chainmail or lighter armor. And only fight with the traditional weapon and styles of their tribe. So, when you, you create a uh, barbarian, you select a region of origin... And this will determine the weapons that, that they typically get to use. So uh, horse archers, of course, will use bows and stuff like that, etc. All barbarians are skilled at climbing sheer rock surfaces. That's your Jutlanders. Uh, they have animal reflexes, giving them plus one initiative and surprise. They are naturally stealthy. So opponents suffer minus one to surprise rolls against them. Uh, they have a savage resilience to survive. Uh, when required to consult the mortal wounds table, they roll twice and pick the, the, their preferred. Anytime a character in this game hits zero level, you roll on the mortal wounds table. And if you roll bad, you could lose like body parts and stuff or just be straight up dead. So that's a good ability. They can use magic items usable by fighters. They have animal magnetism, uh, which allows them to put together hordes of henchmen. Uh, oh, and here's their region, natural proficiencies, and weapons. So that's, that's cool right there. So let's move on, though, because, again, Dwarven Delver, one of my favorite classes in the game. 
prime requisite is dex, but you need a con nine to play. Hit die, die six. Dwarven Delvers, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, they're, they're a combination of uh, almost like a dwarf thief ranger kind of hybrid. They or runners, I guess, from other versions of the game. They live underground in their vaults. They spend all of their time scouting out the caverns and networks and, and patrolling around. And they're basically just your frontiersmen of the Underdark, right? Uh, they get your dwarf abilities to hide. Uh, they get hide and shadow and move silently. They can climb walls, find traps. They're expert cavers. And they also get the other dwarf abilities to detect false walls, hidden construction, etc. Uh, they can backstab. Uh, yeah, they're, I just really like them. It, it pretty much gives you the ability to play a thief, but with a dice six hit die instead of a die four, except you're going to level much slower because you have all of the dwarven abilities as well. Just a great class. Dwarven Fury. All right, kind of like a Balrager, but not. Dwarven Furies don't wear armor. They tattoo themselves. However, their tattoos and rune brands are enchanted. So as they level, their tattoos and rune brands actually give them increased armor class. They are a die eight. Strength is the prime requisite. Uh, they are held in a mixture of awe and contempt within the Dwarven society. And with more than a little fear, because these guys are, like I said, they are berserkers. Uh, many Furies become adventurers in order to better carry the fight to their enemy. They excel at combat. So uh, they do get a damage bonus like fighters. However, as they level, they get an armor class bonus. So a Dwarven Fury at level 13 will have plus six to their armor class, even though they are not wearing armor. That's basically the equivalent of plate mill. Uh, and they do this because of their rune brands and their tattoos. They also get, as I said, the damage bonus of a fighter. But on top of that, they get damage reduction, which is mostly a one, but at higher levels goes up to three. And that is exactly what you think it is. They ignore one point of damage from any attack that hits them at first level, and it improves as they level up. So these guys are just tough. They start out with kind of a weak armor class, unless you stack decks, but um, they're, they're just very resilient. Also, anytime they are forced to roll on the mortal wound, they get to roll twice and pick the result they wish. They get the bonuses to their saving throws. Uh, all in all, just a really cool class. If you want to play a dwarf running around with, you know, runes tattooed all over their body, fighting with a great weapon or dual wielding or whatever, and just being able to soak up damage, the Dwarven Fury is probably your choice. Decent class. Dwarven Machinist. Now, this is a class that I told you one of my players loves his machinist right now, right? The Dwarven Machinist is, I'll go ahead and say it, it's kind of like the, the um, Artificer from 3rd Edition. Kind of. Uh, they can wear uh, some decent armor, not, not a lot, you know, light armor and stuff like that. They can use a ton of weapons, so it, uh, crossbows and, and war picks and things of that nature. They, depending on the, the proficiency you take, they can start the game with an automaton that they get to design. You know, the rules are very simple for designing your automaton. Uh, the person in our group, he chose to make a big war dog. And uh, because they can carry half of their weight and gear on them, his war dog has been set up so that they can use it as a pack animal as well. Uh, are they great combatants? Uh, no, they don't. Adv they advance every four levels instead of every three, but they can wield um, weapon and shield. They can fight two-handed. They cannot dual wield. They can wear chainmail or lighter armor, uh, but they can use the arbalist, the crossbow, dagger, hand axe, mace, and warhammer. 
and they may use any magic item usable by thieves. Interesting, right? They and again they can make their their different automatons. Like all dwarves, they can uh, open locks, find traps. No, these guys, re re regardless, they can open lock and find traps as a thief. They get the dwarven abilities. They get attention to detail. Also, they start the game as a master of a particular type of mechanical craft, such as armor making, clock making, jewelry, weapon smithing, etc. That means this guy starts the game with a bonus three proficiency levels in a craft. That will it help you in a fight? No. Is it really cool? Yes. Uh, the machinist in our group he stacked intelligence, right? He put like his highest thing in intelligence, and your intelligence bonus also gives you additional proficiency. So this guy started out with just like seven levels of proficiencies or something like that. It's really cool. Um, the example they give, though, they give an example of a guy who actually makes an ornithopter that he can fly. It's only a two-hit die thing, but it has a movement of flying at 120 feet, no attacks, no damage, immune to poison, gas, charm, hold, sleep, can carry one passenger, uh, requires an operator, weighs 400 pounds, which means it has a carrying capacity of 200 pounds, right? So if you're willing to pay the, it looks like, uh, 14,000 gold pieces as a dwarf uh, machinist, you could make yourself an ornithopter and then fly that joker around. Uh, add some more money, you could actually throw weapons on the damn thing. Really cool. Really cool idea. Really cool class. Um, next, you have your elven courtier. Kind of like an elven, well... Not really like an elven bard. Hard, okay, never mind. Let's get into it. The elven courtier is an int and charisma prime requisite. Int of nine. Die is requirement. Dice six, right? Uh, these people, the, they, they basically specialize in etiquette and dueling and sword play, right? They're not necessarily specialized in fighting, but they're very comfortable with fighting. Uh, and they can use a lot of weapons that are very much your typical of elves. So swords and short swords, daggers, bows, composite bows, spears, and lances. They can wear chainmail or lighter armor. They, because they have received weapons training, they get a plus one to their attacks when using their choice of melee or missile attacks. Uh, they can cast arcane spells as a mage of half of their level. They also get Diplomacy and Protocol, which give them a plus two bonus on all reaction rolls. They can inspire courage amongst their allies. They can actually uh, add bonuses against magical fear. Uh, they can sing, recite poetry, play uh, uh, an entire group of instruments. And uh, they can work magic through song and poetry. If they conduct a performance and serenade creatures with a per, uh, potential purient interest as a charm person spell, uh, they can also uh, uh, cast a spell as sleep through their song. So they can charm and sleep through music. They have attunement to nature as all elves, attachment to nature as all elves. And at higher level, they can go ahead and create an elven fastness and uh, start putting together the thing. Their max level is 12. So uh, also, they get to add their intelligence bonus to their arcane spells. Uh, I've never really looked at this class, but having talked to you guys about right now, it's actually a pretty neat class. Next, we have the Elven Enchanter. Uh, Int and Charisma are prime requisites. Int 9 requirement, 1 die, 4 hit die, right? Human legend paints elves as bewitching and glamorous yet, tricky and untrustworthy. This is because I think most elves are, you know. Uh, this reputation is not entirely undeserved, for the favorite dwimmer of the elves are charms and illusions. The elven enchanter is a specialist in such glamours. One who can weave subtle marvels of light and sound, torment the senses with phantasms and figments. 
confound the mind and eat of the easily influenced. Elven enchanters might be called to adventure by a desire to experience awe and terror, a quest for rare and forgotten magic, or merely the lure of opulence. Right. So they learn and cast arcane spells. And uh, I think they have their own spell lists, though. And they can only cast the spells that are in their repertoire. So, um, basically like a spell book, but a little bit more limited. They have Mastery of Charms and Illusions, and this gives them several advantages. When they cast Charm Spells or Illusion Spells, the spell is calculated as if he were two classes higher level when, than his actual experience. Targets of the spell suffer a minus two to their saving throw, as do anyone attempting to disbelieve their illusions, the, the uh, elven enchantress's illusions. All enchanters can magically accomplish simple illusion and sleight of hand tricks suitable for impressing peasants, such as lighting a candle or shuffling cards at will. So they basically have the prestidigitation ability as a class ability. They're able to project a glamorous aura that awes, bedazzles, and seduces those in his presence. He gains a plus two bonus to reaction to impress and intimidate people he encounters. And if this results in a total of 12 or more on the reaction table, then the subject acts as if charmed when within uh, his presence. So yeah, sneaky, sneaky. And on top of that, they get all the other elf abilities. So there you go. Also in this game, arcane casters, when they get to the mid-levels, I think seven or eight maybe, can actually start creating magic items, potions, and scrolls, and things like that. So bear that in mind. Moving along, the elven ranger, strength and dex, is their, requ their prime requisite. Their requirement is intelligence. Their hit die is one die six. Their max level is 13. These guys are the only elves that I've encountered so far, I believe, that cannot cast arcane spells. Uh, however, they get a damage bonus to all missile attacks. That's actually pretty substantial as they level up. Again, they're on die six, and they get some really cool other abilities, right? Uh, they get accuracy, so they get plus one bonus to all attack rolls with missile weapons. They automatically get precise shot, which allows them to shoot into combats and have less of a chance of hitting your buddies. They're difficult to spot on a three plus on a die 20. They can just vanish from sight in the forests and underbrush. They're skilled trackers. They can track basically about anything on a throw of 11 plus. Friends with bird and beast. They can understand the body language and moods of normal animals though the animals may not understand the character. This gives the ranger a plus two to all reaction rolls when encountering normal animals, and they can take animals as henchmen. They also can identify flora and fauna on a proficiency throw of 11+. plus. So you need somebody to go find you some magic mushrooms or uh, some healing herbs or something like that. Your rangers are really good at it. They have animal reflexes, so bonus to initiative and surprise. They're attuned to nature, so in uh, nature that, that bonus becomes a plus two. They have keen eyes, as do all elves. Their connection to nature, they're completely unaffected by ghoul paralysis. Uh, they speak common and elven, as well as the language of the forest-dwelling beastmen, the gnoll, the hobgoblin, and the orc. So, yeah, I really like the ranger. We have a ranger in the group, and she is really cool. The gnomish trickster. The only known class in this book, in one of the axioms or the adventures, they actually introduce the gnomish, gnomish alchemist, which apparently is a class that makes a bunch of potions and then chucks them at people. So, pretty cool. Gnomes in this setting are theorized to be... Uh, a stable race that came from the crossing of dwarves and elves at some point in the incredibly distant past. 
Uh, both of the, the dwarves and the elves tend to like not talk about it or deny it. But yeah, they're basically little tricksters. They like to run around and get involved in stuff. Uh, so the, the gnomish trickster is basically a gnomish, okay, it's a mage, kind of combined with a thief a little bit, but not really. Um, they do have a spell progression. They do have die four hit points. On the other hand, let's see, they, uh. He gets plus four bonus to attack rolls and deals double damage on any attack that he uh, ambushes somebody. Uh, they have press dictation. They can uh, perform uh, card tricks, shuffling cards, lighting candles, etc. at will. Uh, once per hour, they can cast fairy fire and ventriloquism. Once per eight hours, they can cast mirror image and phantasmal force. Once per day, they can cast Chimerical Force. Each of these spells take one round to cast and otherwise function exactly like the spell uh, of the same name. Uh, they are resistant to illusions, receiving plus four bonus saving throw to disbelieve magical illusions. Uh, as they advance into casting arcane spells... Uh, starting at level 2, Gnomish Knave, they will learn and cast spells as mages of one half their level, using the same spell list and same rules as, uh, as do the human mage. Uh, however, they can cast spells while wearing armor. And may use any magic items permitted to fighter seeds or mages. Uh, okay, so that's pretty good, right? Uh, what else can they do? They have innate illusion mastery, kind of like the Enchantress. Uh, so anytime they cast an illusion, they get, uh, opponents get a minus two to try and disbelieve it. They also have a nose for potions. Uh, on an 11 plus, they can determine the magical properties of a potion or oil. So pretty good. You find a bunch of potions, the gnome rolls, and on each 11 plus, he knows what that potion is. Right. Starting at level 5, they can brew potions as if they were mages of their class level. At level 10, they can scribe scrolls and research spells as if they were 5th level. They have infravision at 90 feet. They speak dwarf, elf, goblin, and kobold. In addition, they can speak with animals as a spell at will. And if they get high enough level, they can found their own gnomish vault. So there's your gnomes. Next up, the mystic. One of the guys in our group plays a mystic. The mystic, to my, if memory serves me correctly, was introduced in the Beckney set. Uh, so you can find it in your D&D compendium if you're looking for it. The mystic is kind of... And a Asian style monk, but not really, but kind of. Um, the picture in here shows uh, a guy with shaved head, wearing robes, uh, fighting with what looks like two Chinese style long swords. So it, it definitely gives off that Shaolin vibe. So the mystic, prime requisites, wisdom, dex, con, and charisma. Your chances of getting that. 10% XP bonus probably just flew right out the window. Requirements done. Die 6 hit die. Uh, maximum level 14, right? It says here that mystics are members of an ascetic brotherhood focused on perfecting the powers of human body and spirit through rigorous self-discipline and strict training. Mystics attain physical and mental prowess that seem almost magical. In the Iron Empire setting, mystics generally hail from the Sunset Kingdoms of Samaria, Samaria, Chemish, and Keldoria, where they are trained in the ancient monastery fortresses dating back millennia, right? So you want to know about some of their abilities. Well, first off, they get a damage bonus like a fighter. It actually might be a little better than a fighter. Their damage bonus is pretty darn good. 
I mean, plus one, plus one, then at level two, or three, plus two, plus two. I mean, it advances pretty quick. I think at the same level as a fighter, but maybe faster, right? I, I'm not comparing them right now. Uh, they start the game with a graceful fighting style that allows them to add plus one to their armor class, which increases again at 7th and 13th level. However, they cannot wear armor and may not use shields. So, at 13th level, they will have an armor class of 13, unless you stack decks, in which case these guys aren't too bad. Start the game with an armor class of 4, uh, which would translate to Wizard of Coast D&D to a 14, and having no armor at all while you're doing it is Pretty good, right? Uh, the other thing is they're they're very mindful. They notice subtle details and slight differences in air currents and designs. So they get plus four on any proficiency throw to hear noises or detect secret doors. Uh, and they can uh, notice these things on casual observation on an 18 plus. They get a plus one to avoid being surprised. They can, they can enter media, uh, meditative focus in which their body and mind act with hyper-awareness. Uh, entering the focus does not require an action. While in the focus, the mystic gains plus one armor class, plus one to all attack throws, plus one to all proficiency throws, plus one to saving throws, plus one to initiative rolls. And lasts for one turn, 10 minutes. Uh, the mystic can go into focus a number of times equal to their level of experience. So at, you know, fifth level, you can spend basically 50 minutes with plus one to everything, pretty much. At second level, they get strength of spirit that makes them immune to normal and magical fear-based effects. At this level, the mystic knows that fear is only illusion and lets it pass through him. That's some Dune stuff like right there, right? All right, at level three, the mystic develops his speed of thought. The mystic in our group hit level three, and he got this ability, and he was like, all right. Just all over himself, you know, like skeet, skeet. Um, so speed of thought becomes almost superhuman level. Go to store, I'd like a slushy, my love. I have not been good, but I would like a slushy. Contemplate on the tree of woe. Uh, I'm sorry about that. So speed of thought gets an, an additional bonus to initiative and an additional bonus to surprise rolls. So now this guy, I mean, I think he roll, we roll initiative on die six. We roll individual initiative for player characters and monsters by group. And I believe the mystic is currently fronting like a plus four, plus five to his initiative. So you want to go fast or first in this game, play mist, and put your your in, into your your uh, decks. Okay, level four, they get the probability chance, which means when he enters his probability chance, it requires one turn of undisturbed meditation, ten minutes. The probability chance provides the mystic with useful information regarding a question concerning a specific goal. So yeah, this guy is less Shaolin monk and more Paul Atreides. You know, he's uh, you enter your trance and you're looking at all the timelines in the future, trying to pick the one that would be best for you. All right. At fifth level, they get purity of body and soul, and they become immune to all diseases, including magical diseases caused by spells, mummies, and lycanthropes. At fifth level, he's just like disease, nah, no thanks. At 6th level, he gets command of voice, and the undisciplined mind finds it irresistible. He gains plus 2 bonus to reaction rolls with creatures he speaks to. If this bonus results in a total of 12 or more on the chart, the subjects will act as charmed. Creatures with a wisdom greater than the mystic's charisma are immune to this power, and the mystic will know they are immune. So yeah, the more you read these powers, you're thinking, okay, this guy is less, like I said, Shaolin, and more uh, Paul Atreides at level 7. He gets wholeness of body and becomes immune to all forms of poison, including magical poison. At level 8, he can perceive intentions. 
And this allows the mystic to always know the exact reaction result of any creature he interacts with. Creatures with a greater charisma than the mystic's wisdom are immune to this power. At level 9, he can found his own monastery. At level 10, he achieves harmony of spirit, where he lives in balance with the rhythm of the universe, neither controlling nor controlled by fate. This grants him plus 2 bonus to all saving throws. At level 14, he gets perfection of body, where his body simply ceases to age, and his lifespan is multiplied to three times longer than normal. And he won't age. He'll just live as whatever age he was until he gets to the end of his life and then die. So, really cool class. Really mystic, you know. Paul Atreides-like. And these guys can deliver a whomping in combat. The guy in the group, he wanted to use a chain flail type weapon. And I said, yeah, sure. Uh, why not? Uh, it's a die six damage weapon with a reach of ten uh, that he can he can use. I mean, why not? He could have used a spear and and did the same thing. So uh, I tend to let players use uh, weapons that make them happy if it doesn't break the game. All right, so we're at thirty six minutes and we still have a few to go. So I'm going to spin through this really quick. Again, you can hit me up. Next one is the Noberan Wonderworker. Uh, the ancient Nobir were the heroes of the Empyrean War. Kings and prophets granted epic power by the gods. Though these bloodlines have faded with the passing of time, occasionally a scion is still born with great gifts. The Noberan Wonderworker is such a being, blessed with mastery of arcane and divine magic. Noberan Wonderworkers are exceedingly rare. In the Iron Empire, only two Wonderworkers are known. The great Ardashimara of Shamel Alitu, and the mighty Abia called Endura's Wrath. Doubtless in the troubled times ahead, the gods will see fit and bless more with their powers. All right, now my initial uh, thing when I read this is I don't know if you guys ever um, have ever watched any YouTube videos about the Anunnaki and how the gods created special humans to rule over other humans, blah, blah. This is basically that concept. Uh, and these guys, as I said, they are prime requisites, intelligence, and strength requisites, requirements. You have to have an 11 in every attribute. If you don't got an 11 in every single attribute, you can't play these guys. They have a die for hit die, right? And they can cast, starting at first level, they get arcane spells and they get bonus spells as a mage based on intelligence. And then starting at second level, they start being able to cast divine spells. Uh, they have really good saving throws. Their saving throws are amazing. Outside of that, that's really what's up with the uh, class. Um, they get, uh, let's see here, yeah. As they level, or no, they get plus two to all saving throws already factored in. They're ageless. They enjoy a lifespan three times longer than normal humans. They're immune to gold paralysis. They have divine health that renders them immune to all forms of disease. Uh, including magical diseases. Uh, they can lay on hands to heal injuries, uh, healing two points of damage per level when the power is used, and may use this power once per day. If they take the lay on hands proficiency, they gain an additional use of the power. They have the blood of ancient heroes, uh, which allows the character to hire more henchmen than their charisma would otherwise permit. The base morale score of their uh, henchmen, all their henchmen, is increased by one. All right. Uh, they're not really good at combat. They start out with 10 plus to hit armor class zero, so no armor. And it only goes up every six levels of experience, the same as mages. They can only fight with quarterstaffs, clubs, daggers, and darts. They're unable to use shields fight with two weapons, or wear any kind of armor. So yeah, this is basically a cleric mage with a bunch of other really crazy abilities thrown in. At 11th level, they can cast uh, ritual arcane and divine spells of great power, craft magical constructs, and create magical crossbreeds. If chaotic, they may create necromantic servants, and they, they themselves become undead. 
So yeah, that's a crazy character class, right? The Paladin. We know what the Paladin is, except in this game, instead of being a fighter with a die hit die, they are a strength, charisma, prime requisite, a no requirement die six. However, they do get a damage bonus similar to the fighter, and they do get some uh, decent abilities. So let's see, what do they got? Uh, first off, you have to be a Paladin. You have to be lawful. If you lose your lawful alignment, you lose all of your powers. You stay exactly the same. You don't convert to a fighter. You just stay a Paladin, but with no powers. Until you atone yourself, right? If you become evil, though, you just go ahead and become an anti-Paladin. Uh, in exchange to this, you get an R of Protection, which gives you a plus one bonus to armor class, a plus one bonus to saving throws. Uh, from any attacks made uh, by evil creatures, and the aura appears as a golden halo when viewed by detect good, det detect magic, or true sin. You have sanctified body, completely immune to the ravages of disease, including magical diseases. Um, you can detect evil up to 60 feet away by concentrating. Again, I already mentioned how I feel about that. You can lay on hands, and if you choose the lay on hands proficiency, gain an additional use of lay on hands. You get holy fervor, which it, it inspires others to follow you. Any hireling of the same religion as the paladin get plus one to their morale score whenever he is present, and the bonus stacks with other paladin abilities and char uh, charisma and proficiency. You can found a fortress at ninth level or capture one and become a protector of men. So it's a fighter basically with lower hit die but immune to diseases and stuff. And can heal. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Next up, the priestess. Priestesses are human women. And again, any class that doesn't specify as being elf, dwarf, whatever is human. Uh, dedicated to the service of a goddess. Unlike clerics who are trained in fighting, priestess belong to non-military orders. Now, would I allow there to be a priest in a campaign? If it made sense, yes. Just use the same rules and just call it a priest. Uh, within the Iron Empire, priestesses belong to the Sisters of Mourning, Khalifa is their goddess, the Keepers of the Hearth, who, who follow Mediara, or the Temple of the Veiled, Iana who is also, I believe, Hyanna is the goddess that is followed by the uh, uh, Blade Dancers, too. Most priestesses do not become adventurers. And why? Because they don't wear any armor. They're not good at fighting. They advance in combat, as a mage does. They have prime requisites of wisdom and charisma, no requirement, die for hit die, so not, you know, not very sturdy. They can turn undead, though. And the, the, the thing that really makes them super whatever, though, is their pre-spell progression is out of control. Whereas most clerics don't even get a spell. Most divine casters don't even get a spell until second level. These guys start at first level with their spells, and they get bonus spells. So this is actually really good. Um, they, they have to... in. Uh, it says here that they have to, if possible, refrain from taking human or demi-human life. However, this does not uh, include lycanthropes and the undead and various other abominations. All right. At fifth level, they can research spells, inscribe scrolls, brew po potions. At ninth level, they can create uh, weapons, rings, and stabs. At 11th level, they can cast divine rituals. Ritual spells in this game typically require a lot of time to cast, so you'd never cast them during combat, but they are incredibly powerful. Uh, okay, at 9th level, they can actually build their own stronghold called a cloister. At which time they will be joined by 1 die 2 times 10 first level priestesses, and one die six times 30 normal women who want to become priestesses. And there's an 80% chance the previous year's trainees will leave in frustration 
or work their or find their lack of faith or discipline for the life of faith. However, the rest will become priestesses. Okay, they get a lot of proficiencies here. Uh, Yeah, it's just a weird class. They can use any magic weapon. Yeah, it's a weird class. Uh, moving on, though, we have the Shaman. All right, this is going to be a longer video. I, but uh, I mean, 18 classes, yeah. Uh, shamans are a spiritual guide of the tribal people. So we're talking basically Jutlanders, your people from the Ivory Coast, etc. They are responsible for sacred needs of the tribe, mediating with the tribe's ancestral spirits and totem animals, and conducting the tribe's religious rituals. Through his relationship with sacred powers such as God's powerful ancestors and animal spirits, the shaman can heal the sick and inflicted divine wise courses of action, and smite the enemies of his tribe. In the Iron Empire, members of this class might be Druids of Rorn, which is a very Celtic kingdom on the northern continent. Uh, thank you, baby. She did bring me a slushie. Uh, oh, is he happy with... So the dog took a, lip, uh, a lick out of my slushie. Ha ha ha. I'll be all right. He licks me in the face while I'm asleep, so. So what are their abilities? Well, they can, at uh, first level, commune with their ancestral spirits once a week. They have a totem animal, which gives them some abilities. Uh, they can speak with animals. And they're, wow, they get a totem, uh, proficiently, as long as within. So they can actually have a totem animal. So you can have a pet. That's cool. Second level, they can call on sacred powers to gain divine spells. At third level, they can perform spiritual rituals. At fifth level, they can shape change. At seventh level, they can spirit walk. Well, shape change into their totem animal. So you pick your totem animal, and at fifth level, you can shape change into it. And then at ninth level, you can establish a medicine lodge. Also, they can create a bunch of magic items. So moving on, right? Thracian gladiator. Thracians are, ba are lizardmen. Now, in the history of the Aran setting, and many of you know about it because I've done a video about, the Thracians were created by crossbreeding humanity with giant lizards and by elves that had become corrupt. And eventually they rose up and overthrew the corrupt elves. So after a while, the Thracians themselves were overthrown by evil humans who founded the Zaharan Empire and have since become kind of degraded. They've lost a lot of their civilization, a lot of their technology. They live in the fringes out in the wastes and stuff like that. The Thracian gladiator is a Thracian that was captured and thrown into the arena. They are powerfully monstrous combatants, it says. So let's see what that is. Look at their stats. Well, they have, uh, they're bred with thick scaly hides, so their base arm class is three instead of zero. And if the Thracian wears armor, that further increases their armor class. It does, however, reduce their movement rate to 60 per turn, so they're slow. But buck naked, they have the same armor class as a guy wearing uh, chain mail, I believe, or scale mail. They have infravision to 60 feet. They're excellent swimmers with a swimming movement feet of 120. They can hold their breath for 10 minutes without harm. Uh, they are wildly feared and reviled. They suffer a minus two penalty to reaction, loyalty, and morale of humans and demi-humans. Conversely, they get a plus two bonus to the reactions and loyalty and morale of lizardmen, who tend to view them as royalty. At fifth level, they get battlefield prowess and begin to inspire others to follow him. Any henchman or mercenary hired by a gladiator 
Gain plus one bonus to the morale score whenever he personally leads them. And this stacks. At ninth level, they can build a castle and claw his way into a position of authority. And then it has a list of all the different creatures that will be attracted. Uh, so let's look at stats. All right, well, they level slower than a fighter, but they are a die hit, eight hit die. They get damage bonus as a fighter. Max level appears to be 11. They have decent saves and a really good attack throw. Their attack throw is amazing. It actually, they, goes, uh, they get a bonus to hit as they level per level. That's really good. Fighters, I think, are only every other. So, so those guys are really good. The next class, and I think the last one, I think we're just about done. We might pull this off. No, there's still a couple more. The Venturer. Hey, prime requisite, charisma, requirements done, hit die, die for. Have you ever wanted to play a character who was a merchant and was super good at being a merchant? This is the class for you, right? Venturers are exactly that. They're merchants, they're businessmen. Uh, however, they are they are trained in combat. They know how to look out for themselves out on the road. Uh, so they go up in attack throws about every four levels, so basically as thieves. They're devoted to trade and profit, and that means that they're members of a mercantile network. Uh, venturers have contacts, fences, and peddlers that they can lean on pretty much wherever they go. Uh... They're expert bargainers who get the best deal available. So any item the venturer purchases costs 10% less than listed price, and any item that the venturer sells sells for 10% more than listed price as the bargaining proficiency. If trading with another venturer or a character with bargaining proficiency, opposed bargainers should... Uh, the, the winner of an opposed row gets the, uh, the result. They get the hear noise ability as a thief. They're experts at reading languages. On a proficiency throw of 5 plus on a die 20, a venturer can decipher a document, including ciphers, treasure maps, dead languages, but not magical writing. If the roll does not succeed, the venturer may not try to read that particular piece of writing until they reach a, a greater level of experience. Venturers, unlike most merchants, will lead their own caravans and do so with considerable skill. Anytime the venturer's party is in terrain familiar to the venturer, they get a plus four bonus to avoid getting lost. They get plus two bonus uh, to reaction rolls because of their diplomacy. They're exceptionally skilled at the art of bribery. Uh, at 8th level, they can learn and cast arcane spells as mages. At ninth level, they can establish a guild house. So basically, yeah, this is a guy who specializes in being a merchant, but eventually can also become a mage. Kind of neat. The Warlock. Not like what you probably think. While mages are sometimes colloquially referred to as warlocks, the true warlock is a far more sinister individual. A warlock is one who seeks alliances with dark beings and pursues forbidden lore, hoping to find a quicker, easier path to power than the methodical practices of magecraft, one could say the science of arcane spell work. Many war I invent I put that last part in. Many warlocks become adventurers to plumb the secrets of dusty tombs, forgotten crypts, and hidden sanctums. Few do so for heroic motives. So what abilities? Well, they can learn and cast arcane spells. They can speak with animals. At second level, they become occultists, and that allows them to unlock secrets of the dark arts. They can control undead as a chaotic cleric of half their level. Anytime they cast a spell that requires a saving throw versus death, the target gets a minus two penalty on the save. At fourth level, they start being able to bring down harmful, or harmful curses on their enemies. Once per day, the warlock may hex a target creature he can see within 30 feet. 
If the target fails a saving throw versus spells, it immediately suffers the Warlock's choice of one of the following hexes. Minus four decrease to an ability score, minimum one. Minus four penalty to all attack throws and saves. Prime requisite halved, minimum one. Each round of combat, the target has a 50% chance to act normally. Otherwise, it takes no action. A hex cannot be dispelled, but it can be removed with a remove curse. At 6th level, title Necromancer, a warlock can begin contact with dark powers such as demons and evil spirits. These beings possess near omniscience, but contact with them can be mind-shattering. Contacting the dark powers takes 10 minutes, and is so taxing the warlock may only do so once per week. The effect is resolved as per the mage spell, contact other plane. At 7th level, Incantationist, the Warlock may begin researching spells, scribing magic scrolls, and brewing potions. At 8th level, the Warlock gains the ability to alter his shape into what any other humanoid creature, into that of any other humanoid creature. The Warlock can control his new shape's physical qualities, such as height, weight, gender, hair color, hair texture, and skin color within normal ranges for a creature of its kind. Equipment, if any, remains worn or held when possible. So a warlock can turn into like a goblin or something like that. That's kind of cool. Uh, you can do this for no more than eight, uh, once every eight hours. Okay. And it lasts for one year, or one year. Uh, uh, one hour, six turns, plus one turn per level of experience the warlock has gained above eight. At ninth level, the warlock becomes the Dread Lord and may establish a coterie, usually in a remote, desolated area. And that's where you would start, you know, um, attracting uh, apprentices and apostles and stuff like that. At tenth level, the warlock may summon infernal creatures to perform tasks for him. It takes one turn, ten minutes for the summoning to be complete, during which time the warlock may take no other actions. The creature summoned might be an invisible stalker or other chaotic creature at the judge's devising. The summoned creature will serve until the spell evil is cast on the creature, or it is slain, or its task is fulfilled. Uh, the warlock may perform this summoning but one time per month. At 13th level, the Warlock can create magical items such as rings, weapons, and staves. At 14th level, the Warlock uncovers the secret of forbidden spells that fall beyond the kin of normal mages. The four spells listed below are added to his class spell list. Cause disease, speak with dead, cure, or no, cause serious wounds, and finger of death. Crazy. All right, then we have the witch. That actually it looks like the... Nope, we still got the Zaharan to go, so going to be more than an hour, guys. Sorry about that. All right, the witch. The uh, Wisdom and charisma, prime requisites, no requirements, die for. The ignorant will often refer to any female spellcaster as a witch. Actual witches, however, are practitioners of a distinct craft of magic. Like priestesses and shamans, witches invoke divine magic, but they do not organize into communities of faith, nor do they dedicate themselves to the service of their gods or goddesses. Rather, the relationship of a witch to her divine patron is that of a student to a teacher, rooted in ancient pact and secretive traditions. The witch seeks to gain permanent knowledge and strength by accepting the guidance and patronage of ancient powers. Within the Iron Empire, witches are viewed with deep suspicion by the Imperium priests, but many rural villages nevertheless have a wise woman with some skill in witchcraft. Witches are fairly common in southern Argole, Jutland, Rorn, Chemish, and the Ivory Kingdoms, each of which has a flourishing tradition of witchcraft. Okay. So starting first level, witches can cast divine spells granted through their esoteric nighttime rituals. At third level, they may begin to brew potions. At fifth level, she's able to research spells. At seventh level, may scribe magic scrolls. And at ninth level, create more powerful artifacts such as weapons, rings, and stabs. At eleventh level, 
she may be able to cast uh, div uh, divine ritual spells and craft magical constructs, so golems and stuff like that, right? Every witch must belong to a tradition which defines their approach to magic. And then on this page, there's all your, your traditions like, and where they're most common. Like the antiquarian uh, tradition, common in the Iron Empire and Jutland, uh, who are generally wise women who focus on healing and beneficial potions. They practice their traditional craft wherever rural human settlements may be found. Then you have the Chthonic tradition, most notably found in Kamesh, one of the kingdoms to the far west. Malefic practitioners who consort with the darkest of powers, reveling in the seduction and corruption of the innocent. Then the Sylvan tradition, found in southern Argolay and Rorn, reclusive witches who travel the borderlands between human settlements and the Fey Wilds, the Fey Forests. Then the Vodon, from the Ivory Kingdoms to the south, tribal witches who barter with ancestral spirits and animalistic powers to gain power over the living and the dead. And each of these traditions gives you bonus spells. So at each level, you get a bonus spell in addition to um, whatever spells you might normally have. Uh, as you level up, you, get, you start with uh, only casting first level spells until fourth level when you get your first second level spell. But then after that, uh, by seventh level, you will be casting spells of all five levels. There's only five levels of divine spells. Of course, everything higher than fifth level is considered a ritual. So there's no, I'm going to raise dead as a spell, but there is a raise dead ritual. Their attack throws aren't too bad. They're not too great. Their saving throws are really good. Upon ninth level, you can establish a coven, usually in a remote and desolate location, and you will attract... One die six apprentices of the tradition of the witch of levels between one and three, plus two die six normal women seeking to become witches. So, uh, also, there's some other stuff too. Um, the an antiquarian at first level, with simple herbs and medicinal folklore, the antiquarian learned to treat ailments and injury. This witch, uh, uh, for free, gains one rank of the healing proficiency. At third level, you know much that has been lost. You gain the power to cure moderate wounds by touch once every eight hours. Each use takes ten turn, or one turn, ten minutes. And then at fifth level, the antiquarian witch expands knowledge of herbs and brews into truly arcane formulations. She gains a rank of the alchemy proficiency for free. At seventh level, poisons much studied and little feared by the antiquarian witch. She gains the power to neutralize poisons once per day. That's pretty good. Now, your Chthonic Witch, what powers do they get? In addition to their bonus spells, uh, at first level, they learn the, the depraved art of pleasure from the dark powers and gains the seduction. Proficiency at third level, the mysteries of death are unlocked. She gains the black lore of Zahar proficiency. At fifth level, the Chthonic Witch's ravishing glamour None can resist, so she gains the Mystic Aura proficiency. Uh, at 7th level, the Dark Whispers of the Chthonic Witch can dominate the weak will. The Wish gains the power to charm person once per day. Sylvan Witches, okay. Uh, at 1st level, you get the Beast Friendship proficiency. At 3rd level, you get the power to change shape as a Warlock once per day. At fifth level, you gain the ability to move through the forest, uh, passing without trace is that proficiency. At seventh level, no longer bound by a humanoid form, you get the ability to polymorph self once per week. And the Voodon. All right, the Voodon, at first level, you gain craft proficiency of your choice. That's pretty good. At third level, you gain gray lore, straddling darkness and light. You gain the ability to turn undead as a cleric of one half of her class level. When a witch casts spells that inflict fear effects, such as cause fear, the spell effects are calculated as if she were two class levels higher, and targets get a minus two saving throw. 
at fifth level through ecstatic dancing while drumming and chanting. The Budan can bewitch and deceive. She gains mastery of charms and illusions, identical to that of an elven enchanter. So that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. All right. And now the last one. Over an hour, if you guys are hanging in here, I'm going to put timestamps on, I think, for each class so people can jump around. All right. The Zaharan Ruin Guard, right? Strength and intelligence are the prime requisites. Requirements are Int 9, Wisdom 9, Charisma 9, Die 6, Hit Die. And I'll read the first bit. In the waning days of the decadent Zaharan Empire... As its graceful cities burned to ash and the races of man, elf, and dwarf slaughtered the children of Zahar without mercy for their arrogance and tyranny, an order of militant sorcerer knights known as Ruin Guards was ordained by Sebek, last of the sorcerer kings. The Ruin Guards were charged with safeguarding the powerful secrets of the Chthonic gods and laying down their lives to prevent the voice of chaos from passing into oblivion. So these are straight up Chaos Knights. All right, so let's see what uh, ability we, we get. It says here that, uh, all right, they get fighting ability, just like a fighter or a paladin. They get bonus damage. They can use any armor. They, however, can only fight with specific weapons, such as the sword, the two-handed sword, battle axe, great axe, flail, and whip. So, and they increase their damage with these weapons at every third level. They are trained to fight wielding a weapon and shield and wielding a two-handed weapon. Um, and they generally wear any armor available, favoring the heaviest available. They can't use shields. Okay. They enjoy the dark blessing of the Chthonic gods, which provide them plus two to all saving throws. Uh, they enjoy a preternatural quickening that grants them a plus one to surprise and initiative rolls. And at first level, they choose a specific weapon, battle axe, great axe, flail, sword, whip, sword, uh, two-hand sword, and are considered to possess focus when welding that type of weapon. Um, if I remember correctly, if memory serves me, weapon focus means on a 20, they do double damage. Unless you take th that actual proficiency uh, with a weapon, uh, then a 20 is just a hit, a an automatic hit, but is not double damage. However, if you take the proficiency, then a nat 20 does become a double damage thing. As sorcerers as well as warriors, Ruin Guards learn to cast arcane spells as mages at half their level. Using the same spell list and the same rules, for casting spells. Unlike mages, the Zyran Rune Guard may cast spells while wearing any type of armor. They can use any magical items available to mages or fighters. That's pretty badass, right? As the Rune Guard achieves experience, they gain mastery over weapons. And Okay, so they get a smite ability called Arcane Striking at second level. They can expend one of their daily spell slots to increase the damage by one die six per level of the spell slot expended. They also get death healing, which manifests at fourth level when the Ruin Guard successfully slays a sentient creature with a melee attack. He can, in lieu of cleaving, expend a spell slot to heal himself. Healing one die six per level of the spell slot expended to a maximum value equal to the slain victim's starting hit points. All right, that's pretty good. Wow. They can also cast spells onto their, uh, their weapons, uh, basically using it as spell storing, and then later using the weapon to cast it. They speak Kameshi, Ancient Zaran, Goblin, and Orc. 
They also possess certain inhuman benefits and drawbacks from their near-extinct bloodline. These are humans. They're just of a type. Uh, they are, have ancient pacts of service and obedience with the lords of Zahar and sorcelled the dark powers of the world. Some creatures still remember these pacts and will aid Zaharans when commanded. All rune guards gain plus two bonus to reaction rolls when encountering encountering intelligent chaotic monsters. So your beastmen stuff like that. They're immune to ma magic or natural and magical fear. And they have the power of after the flesh. If transformed into an intelligent undead, uh, either on purpose or by a monster, they retain all of their racial powers and all of their class powers. And they can continue to advance in hit die without limit. However, because of their dark souls, whenever they have to roll on the tampering with mortality table, they suffer a penalty on the die 20 of minus one per level of experience. Wow, okay. Pretty rough. At 5th level, they gain Dark Charisma, which gives any creatures following them, their henchmen or whatever, a plus 1 to morale. At ninth level, they can build a Dark Fortress. And that, at 1, 1, 1, and 16, that is all of the classes in the Adventure Conqueror King Player's Companion. In my opinion, a necessity. Does that make it a necessity? No. Just in my opinion, you know. Um, I think a lot of the classes in there are really cool. I'm a, especially a huge fan of the Dwarven Delver. The Dwarven Fury, I think, is a neat class. Some of them are obviously not really, depending on your campaign, you're probably not going to have a Paladin and a, a Zaren Ruin Guard in the same group, unless, you know, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, it's just... Uh, Really interesting. And another thing about Adventure Conquer King is they add classes in a lot of their adventures and the axioms, which are kind of like a zine that the Adventure Conquer King guys release about once a month or so. Um, if you become a patron, then you can download a lot of these axioms for free, or you can buy, I think Axiom 1 through 8 is available print on demand from Drive Through RPG. Um, People in the Discord have, <clears throat> my voice cracked there, I must be entering puberty. People in the Discord have mentioned to uh, Mr. Macris of maybe putting together a book that compiles all the classes together and all of the abilities, you know, the whatever the rules for those classes. Um, right now, he has no plans for that, but it has not been ruled out. I believe the last time he said anything he was working on outside of Ascendant, which was released, uh, is maybe a, you know, the Book of the Acts or something, you know, something going into a lot more detail about the dwarves of the uh, uh, Adventure Conquer King setting, which dwarves being my second favorite race in the game after humans, I would immediately just chuck a handful of cash for something like that, so... Peace and love, guys. I know I've kind of swarmed you with videos today, but it is what it is. Uh, have a good one. Hit in recording, and it told me to bugger off. It was like, DM James, we're still recording.